Hi, I'm Brian Mills. I work on the Go open source project at Google. Uh, in this talk, we're going to rethink some classical concurrency patterns that you may have encountered in Go programs. This talk covers two principles that you'll hopefully find familiar. We're going to apply them to some concurrency patterns that are hopefully also familiar. The two principles relate to the two Go concurrency primitives, Go routines and channels. The first principle is start Go routines when you have concurrent work. The second principle is share by communicating. If you understand the implications of these two principles, I have nothing more to teach you in this talk. But I've written about 100 slides trying to understand them myself, and I'd certainly appreciate your feedback. So first, we'll examine the basic asynchronous patterns, futures and queues, which function as the concurrency primitives in some other languages. Then we'll do a deep dive on condition variables. Now, if you've been scuba diving, you know that the deeper you dive, the less time you can spend at depth. These slides are going to have a lot of code, but we're not going to spend much time on the details. Uh, the slides will be available after the talk, and there are going to be playground links in the notes. In the third section, we'll apply what we've learned to analyze the worker pool pattern. First, let's talk about asynchronous APIs. You've heard from Rob Pike that concurrency is not parallelism. Concurrency is not asynchronicity, either. For the purpose of this talk, an asynchronous API is one that returns to the calling function early. An asynchronous program is not necessarily concurrent. A program could call an asynchronous function and then sit idle waiting for the results. Some poorly written asynchronous programs do exactly that. They make a sequential chain of calls that each return early, wait for a result, and then start the next call. Programmers coming to go from certain languages, such as JavaScript, sometimes start with asynchronous callbacks, because that's the way they're used to structuring code. The problems with asynchronous callbacks are well described already. You may be thinking, why are we talking about callbacks? This is Go, and Go programmers know to use channels and Go routines instead. Well, I agree. Please don't use asynchronous callbacks, and we won't discuss them further. <laughs> but that brings us to two other asynchronous patterns, futures and producer-consumer queues. In the future pattern, instead of returning the result, the function returns a proxy object that allows the caller to wait for the result at some later point. You may also know futures by the name async and await in languages that have built-in support for the pattern. The usual Go analog to a future is a single element buffered channel that receives a single value and often starts a Go routine to compute that value. It's not exactly the conventional future pattern, since we can only receive the value from the channel once. But the channel pattern seems to be a lot more common than the function-based alternative. Callers of a future-based API set up the work, then retrieve the results. If they retrieve the results too early, the program executes sequentially instead of concurrently. A producer-consumer queue also returns a channel, but the channel receives any number of results and is typically unbuffered. The call site is a range loop rather than a single receive operation. Now that we know what an asynchronous API looks like, let's examine the reasons we might want to use them. Most other languages don't multiplex across OS threads, and kernel schedulers can be unpredictable. So some popular languages and frameworks keep all of the UI or network logic on a single thread. If that thread makes a call that blocks for too long, the UI becomes choppy or network latency spikes. Since calls to asynchronous APIs by definition don't block, they help keep the single-threaded programs responsive. On some platforms, OS threads are, or at least historically have been, expensive. Languages that don't multiplex over threads can use asynchronous APIs to keep threads busy, reducing the total number of threads and context switches needed to run the program. These first two benefits don't apply in Go. The runtime manages threads for us, so there is no single UI or network thread to block, and we don't have to touch the kernel to switch Go routines. Kavya gave a lot more detail about that in her excellent talk this morning, so we'll leave that at that. 
Now, the runtime also re resizes and reallocates uh, thread stacks as needed. So GoRoutine stacks can be very small, and they don't need to fragment the address space with guard pages. Uh, today, a GoRoutine stack starts around 2 kilobytes, which is half the size of the smallest AMD64 page. An asynchronous call may allow the caller to return from arbitrarily many frames of the stack. That frees up the memory containing those stack frames for other uses and allows the Go runtime to collect any other allocations that are only reachable from those frames. Sometimes reclaiming stack frames is an optimization, but sometimes it isn't. Any reference that escapes its frame must be allocated in the heap, and heap allocations are more expensive in terms of CPU, memory, and cache. Furthermore, the compiler can already prune out any stack allocations that it knows are unreachable. It can move large allocations to the heap, and the garbage collector can ignore dead references. Finally, the benefit of this optimization depends on the specific call site. If the caller doesn't have a lot of data on the stack in the first place, then making the call asynchronous won't help much. When we take all that into account, asynchronicity as an optimization is very subtle. It requires careful benchmarks for the impact on specific callers, and the impact may change or even reverse from one version of the runtime to the next. It's not the sort of optimization we want to build a stable API around. So a final benefit of asynchronous APIs really does apply in Go. When an asynchronous function returns, the caller can immediately make further calls to start other concurrent work. Concurrency can be especially important for network RPCs, where the CPU cost of a call is very low compared to its latency. Unfortunately, that benefit comes at the cost of making the caller side of the API much less clear. So let's look at some examples. Suppose we come across an asynchronous call while we're debugging or doing a code review. What can we infer about it from the call site? If we return without waiting for the futures to complete, how long will they continue using resources? Might we start fetches faster than we can retire them and run out of memory? Will fetch keep using the passed in context after it has returned? If so, what happens if we cancel it and then try to read from the channel? Will we receive a zero value, some other sentinel value? Will we block? If we return without draining the channel from glob, will we leak a go routine that's sending to it? Will glob keep using the passed in context as we iterate over the results? If so, what happens if we cancel it? Will we still get results? When, if ever, will the channel be closed in that case? These asynchronous APIs raise a lot of questions. And to answer those questions, we would have to go digging around in the documentation if the answers are even there. So let's rethink this pattern. How can we get the benefits of asynchronicity without this ambiguity? Let's go back to the drawing board. Way back to the drawing board. We're using Go routines to implement these asynchronous APIs. But what is a Go routine, anyway? A Go routine is the execution of a function. If we don't have another function to execute, a Go routine adds complexity without benefit. The benefit of asynchronicity is that it allows the caller to initiate other work. But how do we know that the caller even has any other work? Functions like fetch and glob shouldn't need to know what other work their callers may be doing. That's not their job. In languages without threads or coroutines, asynchronous APIs are viral. If we can't execute function calls concurrently, any function that may be concurrent must be asynchronous. In contrast, in Go, it's very easy to wrap an asynchronous API to make it synchronous or vice versa. We can write the clearer API and adapt it as needed at the call site. If we keep the API synchronous, we may need to add concurrency at the call site. Consider a synchronous version of our fetch function. The cancellation and error behavior is so obvious from the function signature that we don't need extra documentation for it now. The caller can use whatever pattern they like to add concurrency. In many cases, they won't even need to go through channels, so the questions about channel usage won't even arise. Here, we're using the golang.org xsync airgroup package, 
and writing the results directly into local variables. As long as we present a simple, synchronous API to the caller, they don't need to care how many concurrent calls its implementation makes. For example, consider a synchronous version of our glob function. Internally, it can fetch all of its items concurrently and stream them to a channel, but the caller doesn't need to know that. And because the channel is local to the function, we can see both the sender and the receiver locally. That makes the answers to our channel questions obvious. Since the send is unconditional, the receive loop must drain the channel. In case of error, the error variable is set, and the channel is still closed. In Go, synchronous and asynchronous APIs are equally expressive. We can call synchronous APIs concurrently, and they're clearer at the call site. We don't need to pay the cost of asynchronicity to get the benefits of concurrency. Condition variables, our next classical pattern, are part of a larger concurrency pattern called monitors. But the phrase condition variable appears in the Go standard library, whereas monitor in this sense does not. So that's what this section is called. The concept of monitors dates to 1973 and condition variables to 1974. So this is a fairly old pattern. First, a quick refresher on condition variables. Let's look at a simple example, an unbounded queue of items. A Go condition variable must be associated with a mutex or another sync.locker. The two basic operations on condition variables are wait and signal. Wait atomically unlocks the mutex and suspends the calling Go routine. Signal wakes up a waiting Go routine, which then relocks the mutex before proceeding. In our queue, we can use wait to block on the availability of enqueued items and signal to indicate when another item has been added. Broadcast wakes up all of the waiting Go routines instead of just one. Broadcast is usually for events that affect all waiters, such as marking the end of the queue. However, it is sometimes used to wake up some waiter or waiters when we don't know exactly which are eligible. Here, we've changed get to get many. After a put, one of the waiting get many calls may be ready to complete. But put has no way of knowing which one to wake, so it must wake all of them. That's the basic condition variable operations. Now, condition variables have a lot of different use cases that we'll want to focus on one at a time. But the downsides are similar for all of them, so we'll start there this time. For events that aren't really global, broadcast may wake up too many waiters. For example, one call to put wakes up all of the get many callers, even though at most one of them will be able to complete. Even signal can result in spurious wake-ups. If put used signal instead of broadcast, it could wake up a caller that is not yet ready instead of one that is. If it does that repeatedly, it could strand items in the queue without corresponding wake-ups. If we're very careful, we can minimize or avoid these spurious wake-ups. But that generally adds even more complexity and subtlety to the code. And if we prune out the spurious signals too aggressively, we risk going too far and dropping some that are actually necessary. And since the condition variable decouples the signal from the data, it's easy to add some new code to update the data and forget to signal the condition. Even if we don't forget a signal, if the waiters are not uniform, the pickier ones can starve. Suppose that we have one call to get many 3,000 and one caller executing get many three in a tight loop. The two waiters will be about equally likely to wake up, but the get many three call will be able to consume three items every three calls, whereas get many 3,000 won't have enough ready. The queue will remain drained, and the larger call will block forever. Now, if we happen to notice this starvation problem ahead of time, we could add an explicit wait queue to avoid starvation, but that again makes the code more complex. 
The whole point of condition variables is to put a Go routine to sleep while we wait for something to happen. But while we're waiting for that condition, we may miss some other event that we ought to notice too. For example, the caller might decide that they don't want to wait that long and cancel the passed in context, expecting us to notice and return more or less immediately. Unfortunately, condition variables only let us wait for events associated with their own mutex. So we can't select on a condition and a cancellation at the same time. Even if the caller cancels, our call will block until the next time the condition is signaled. Fundamentally, condition variables rely on communicating by shared memory. They signal that a change has occurred, but they leave it up to the signaled Go routine to check other shared variables to figure out what changed. On the other hand, the Go approach is to share by communicating. Share by communicating. OK, what does that even mean here? Well, let's look at the use cases for condition variables and rethink them in terms of communication. Perhaps we'll spot a pattern. A signal or a broadcast on a condition variable tells the waiters that something has changed. Often, that something is the availability of a shared resource, such as a connection or a buffer in a pool. So let's look at a concrete example. Our resources for this example will be net cons in a pool, and we'll start with the condition variable version for reference. We've got a limit on the total number of connections, plus a pool of idle connections, and a condition variable that tells us when the set of connections changes. When we're done with a connection, we can either release it back into the idle pool or hijack it so that it no longer counts against the limit. To acquire a connection, we wait until we have an idle connection to reuse or are under the limit. Now let's rethink. Let's share resources by communicating the resources themselves. And the limit is a resource, too. In particular, an available slot toward the limit is a thing that we can consume. Effective Go even has a hint for that. It mentions another classical concurrency pattern, the semaphore, which was described by Dijkstra way back in the early 60s. So we'll have a channel for the limit tokens and one for the idle connection resources. A send on the semaphore channel will communicate that we have consumed a slot toward the limit. And the idle channel will communicate the actual connections as they are idled. Now release and hijack have become trivial. Release literally puts the connection back into the pool. Hijack releases a token from the semaphore. They've dropped from four line bodies to one line each. Instead of locking, storing the resource, signaling, and unlocking, they simply communicate the resource. If we really wanted to, we could use a single channel for this instead of two. We could use a nil netcon to represent permission to create a new connection. Personally, I think the code is clearer with separate channels. Acquire ends up a lot simpler, too. And even cancellation is just one more case in the select. Conditions can also indicate the presence of new data for processing. Let's go back to our queue example. For the single item get and put, a signal indicates the availability of an item of data. While in the get many version, it indicates potential availability of an item that some other Go routine may have already consumed. That imprecise targeting is the cause of both spurious wakeups and starvation. To avoid spurious wakeups, we should signal only the Go routine that will actually consume the data. But if we know which Go routine will consume the data, we may as well send the data along, too. Sending the data makes it much easier to see whether the signal is spurious. 
If we resend the exact same data to the same receiver, or if the caller explicitly ignores the channel receive, for example, by executing a continue in a range loop, then we probably didn't need to send it in the first place. Sending the data also makes signals harder to forget. We'll very likely notice if we compute data and then don't send it anywhere, although we do still have to be careful to send it to all interested receivers. So how do we identify the right receivers? The information about who needs which data is also data. We can communicate that, too. We'll start with the single item get. Here, we need two channels, one to communicate the items and another to communicate whether any items even exist. Both will have a buffer size of one. The items channel functions like a mutex, while the empty channel is like a, a one-token semaphore. This time, we really do need the two separate channels. Put needs to know when there are no items so that it can start a new slice. But get wants only non-empty items. To support cancellation in get, all we have to do is move that initial channel receive into a select statement. We don't need to select on the sends at the end because we know they won't block. When we received the items, we also received the information that our Go routine owns those items. So that's get with one item. What about get many? To figure out whether we should wake a get many caller, we need to know how many items it wants. Then we need a channel on which we can send those items to that particular caller. We'll put the items and the metadata together in one queue state struct, and just for good measure, we'll share that state by communicating it too. A channel with a one element buffer functions much like a selectable mutex. To get a run of items, we first check the current state for sufficient items. If there aren't enough, we add an entry to the metadata. To put an item to the queue, we append it to the current state and then check the metadata to see whether that makes enough items to send to the next waiter. When we don't have enough items left, we'll stop sending items and send back the updated state. Since all of this communication occurs on channels, it is possible to plumb in cancellation here too. But that's too much code to fit into this talk. So we'll leave it as an exercise. Now broadcast on a condition may signal a transition from one state to another. For example, it may indicate that the program has finished loading its initial configuration or that a communication stream has been terminated. One simple state transition is the transition from busy to idle. Using condition variables, we need to store the state explicitly. You might think we would only need to store the current state, the busy Boolean, but that turns out to be a very subtle decision. If a wait idle looped only until it saw a non-busy state, it would be possible to transition from busy to idle and back before await idle got a chance to check, and we would miss short idle events. Go's condition variables, unlike pthread condition variables, don't have spurious wakeups. So in theory, we could return from await idle unconditionally after the first wait call. However, it's also common for condition-based code to intentionally over-signal for example, to work around an undiagnosed deadlock. So to avoid introducing subtle problems later, it's best to keep the code robust to spurious wakeups. Instead, we can track the cumulative count of events and wait until either we catch the idle event in progress or observe its effect on the counter. We can avoid the double state transition race entirely 
by communicating the transition instead of signaling it. And we can plumb in cancellation to boot. We can broadcast a state transition by closing a channel. There's a nice symmetry to that. A state transition marks the completion of the previous state, and closing a channel marks the completion of the communication on that channel. So here is an example showing how that fits together. Set busy allocates a new channel on the idle to busy transition and closes the previous channel, if any, on the busy to idle transition. Broadcast may also signal ephemeral events, such as configuration reload requests. We can treat broadcast events like data updates and send them individually to each interested subscriber. The OS signal package in the standard library takes that approach so that waiters can receive multiple events on the same channel. Alternately, we can treat the event as the completion of the hasn't happened yet state and indicate it by closing a channel. That typically results in fewer channel allocations, but when we have closed the channel, we can't communicate any additional data about the event. Did you spot the pattern in this section? When we share by communicating, we should communicate the things that we want to share, not just messages about them. We started with asynchronous patterns which deal with Go routines. Then we looked at condition variables, which sometimes deal with resources. Now let's put them together. The worker pool is a pattern that treats a set of Go routines as resources. Now just a note on terminology here. In other languages, this pattern is usually called a thread pool. But in Go, we're working with Go routines instead of threads, so we usually just call them workers. In the worker pool pattern, we start up a fixed number of worker Go routines that each read and perform tasks from a channel. Another Go routine, often the same one that started the workers, sends the tasks to the workers. The sender blocks until a worker is available to receive the next task. In languages with heavyweight threads, the worker pool pattern allows us to reuse threads for multiple tasks, avoiding the overhead of creating and destroying threads for small amounts of work. That benefit doesn't apply in Go. Remember Kavya's talk? The Go runtime already distributes Go routines across threads. It knows how many system threads we have available and can reschedule the Go routines e efficiently when they block. The benefit that worker pools do provide in Go is to limit the amount of concurrent work in flight. If each task needs some limited resource, such as file handles, network bandwidth, or even a non-trivial amount of RAM, a worker pool can bound the peak resource usage of the program. The simple worker pool I showed you earlier has a problem. It leaks the workers forever. If the API we're implementing is synchronous, and remember what we said before about asynchronous APIs, or if we want to be able to reset the worker state for a unit test, then we need to be able to shut down the workers and know when they've finished. Cleaning up the workers adds a bit more boilerplate to the pattern. First, we'll add a wake group to track the Go routines. Then, after we send the work, we can close the channel and wait for the workers to exit. But we may have another problem. Even if we remember to clean up the workers when we're done, we may leave them idle for a long time, especially toward the end of work. 
and the end of work may be forever if we've accidentally deadlocked something. Assuming we've remembered to clean up, if we have a deadlock, our tests will hang instead of passing. So at least we can get a Go routine dump to help debug, right? Hmm. All those idle workers are still hanging around in our Go routine dump. That makes the interesting Go routines a lot harder to find, especially if our program happens to be a large service implemented with several different pools. It will also be a problem if we want to use the Go routine dump to debug other issues, such as crashes or memory leaks. This is an actual Go routine dump from a test failure involving a deadlock between a worker pool and the Go routine that feeds it. This one is even just a toy. There's only one pool, and it only has 100 workers. Even so, one of the Go routines involved in the deadlock ended up all the way at the bottom of page four. And these are long pages. And remember, Go routines are lightweight. They're not free. Those idle workers still have a resource cost, too. And for large pools, that cost may not be completely negligible. So let's rethink this pattern. How can we get the same benefits as worker pools without the complexity of workers and their lifetimes? We want to start the Go routines only when we're actually ready to do the work and let them exit as soon as the work is done. Let's do just that part and see where we end up. If we only need to distribute work across threads, we can omit the worker pool and its channel and use only the wait group. This code is a lot simpler, but now we need to figure out how to limit the in-flight work again. We already have a pattern for that. Remember, limits are resources. So let's use the semaphore channel pattern from the last section. The semaphore example in Effective Go acquires a token inside the Go routine, but we'll acquire it earlier, right where we had the wait group add call. We don't want a lot of Go routines sitting around doing nothing. And this way, we have only one idle Go routine instead of many. Recall that we acquire this semaphore by sending a token, and we release it by discarding a token. Now, this semaphore fits in pretty nicely in place of the wait group, and that's no accident. Sync.wait group is very similar to a semaphore. The only major difference is that the wait group allows further ad calls during wait, whereas our wait loop on our semaphore channel does not. Fortunately, that usually doesn't matter, as in this case. Remember our first worker pool with the two loops and how we leaked all those idle workers forever? If you look carefully, these are the same two loops swapped around. We've eliminated the leak without adding any net lines of code. So let's recap. But before that, I have one last note to add. In this talk, I have focused on making the code clear and robust. The patterns I'm recommending here should all be reasonably efficient. They're generally the right asymptotic complexity, and they have reasonable constant factors. But I don't promise that they provide optimal performance. I haven't benchmarked them. If you have, you may find that performance is better with one of the patterns I've cautioned against. You may take the downsides of those patterns into account and decide to use those patterns anyway. If you do, please remember to document your reasoning and check in the benchmarks that support it. The Go language itself doesn't change much at the moment, but the implementation certainly does. So here's what we've learned. Start Go routines when you have concurrent work to do immediately. Don't contort the API to avoid blocking the caller. And don't spool up idle workers that will just fill up your Go routine dumps. 
It's easy to start Go routines when you need them, and it's easy to block when you don't. Share things by communicating those things directly. Opaque signals about shared memory make it entirely too easy to send the signals to the wrong place or miss them entirely. Instead, communicate where things need to go, and then communicate to send them there. Thank you for your time and attention.